Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's. This is a place where Grace abounds. Grace abounds for us on the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany. It's almost Lent. Can you believe that? Lent is just right around the corner. I will turn your attention to reflecting His light. Um, we have a couple things coming up. Uh, ladies' aid meeting this coming Saturday, February 18th uh, at noon. Come join us for a cup of coffee or tea, and of course, a piece of cake. Following next weekend, we'll be uh, celebrating the, the transfiguration of our Lord, which is sort of the, the culmination of the Epiphany season. Um, we will jump into the season of Lent. That coming Wednesday, the 22nd, is Ash Wednesday. And I will be available here in the morning uh, from uh, like 6 o'clock a.m. Yes, Pastor Jim will be over at 6 a.m. For ashes, I'll be on the side area over here in the side chapel. And uh, if you wish to get ashes before your day, before going off to work or whatever, stop on by. It's a very quick process. Of course, we will be having imposition of ashes at the Ash Wednesday service later on the day at 7 o'clock. Um, so definitely uh, either one is available to you. Just want to offer that up. And then we'll be having our Lent and midweek services throughout the Wednesdays in Lent before Holy Week. Under updates and information, you can see a write-up on our Lenten series that we're going to be doing called Promised Treasures. Really exciting series from CPH, um, how the gospel is communicated through physical senses, things like sight, smell, touch, and taste, uh, each theme deals with a different way that the gospel is communicated to us. I'm excited for that. Uh, we are going to be doing Promised Treasures Bible study in our weekly Bible studies uh, starting that next, not this week, but the following week, the week of Ash Wednesday. So our Bible studies this week, we're going to speed through the rest of 2 Corinthians. Okay? We're going to do it. We have like two and a half chapters left. We're just going to go full speed ahead, all right, we're going to finish out the book so that we can be um, on a, a good place for when we, when we start the Promised Treasures Bible study. Question? No questions. Will doesn't interrupt. Oh, that's right. Okay. Well, if there's no interruptions, we'll get through the whole, the whole study. Is that fun Bible study? It's a blast. I don't even have to sell it, okay? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. <laughs> a couple notes about the service. So today, uh, we have, you guys gotta check this. You'll see them when you, when you walk by. These are gorgeous. I won't mention who put these in here. Uh, you can probably guess. Uh, but they're absolutely gorgeous, and they hold the baskets for the communion cup. So if you're looking for them, you're not gonna find them in the pews, but over here, uh, on the sides, uh, you can discard of your communion cup. Awesome, they look great. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated last night in Trivia Night. We had a good turnout uh, and a whole lot of fun. And uh, the team labeled the dummies are the ones who won. If you can believe that. And in second place was the leftovers. That's right. Had a ton of fun. Uh, so again, thank you for that. May God bless our time together. Everything you need to know for the service is in the bulletin or up on the screen. Um, let us begin with prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for bringing us through these doors to once again hear the good news proclaimed to us, to receive your good gifts and promises. We thank you. For the gospel message. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins and the hope that we have. Bless us with your spirit and guide us in truth. May we continue to grow in our dependence upon you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we begin with our opening hymn.
word for your baptism. What is baptism? What does such baptizing with water indicate? God's baptized people, therefore, let's do that. Let us repent anew that we may arise to live. But first, let me ask, what is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive the absolution, that is, the forgiveness from the pastor as we are ourselves, not doubting, but firmly believing. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth.
The Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany is in Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land where you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. Thanks be to God. The psalm verse is appointed for this morning on the first eight verses of Psalm 119. And let us recite these verses together. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, and I shall not be put to shame. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your just and righteous decrees. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. The epistle is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. <laughs> and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. 
For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard, it said, heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for our hymn of the day.
Christ. In our epistle text this morning, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready. Let me set the context for these words. It was Paul who came into Corinth and planted the church. He came in and he preached the good news of Christ and him crucified for the sins of the world. And by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit through that word, and yes, even accompanied by some signs and wonders unique to apostolic authority, some had come to faith. And these newly baptized believers, they gathered together as a church. And Paul fed them. He fed them with the word and continued to feed them with the word. He was their, their spiritual father. And they were infants, infant Christians, having just come to faith. And so he fed them accordingly. Right? What do you feed an infant? Well, they're, they're not going to have a, an easy time with a nice eight-ounce eight sirloin steak, right? You feed them milk, appropriate to where they're at. And that's where Paul started. He said, I fed you with milk, not with solid food. You weren't ready for it. He laid the foundation Christ and him crucified for sinners. This is the gospel message. You start with the basics. Kindergarten Christianity, if you will. And that's where they were, and there was nothing wrong with that, of course. But that was four or five years ago. The foundation had been laid, and excellent preachers and teachers had come in, like, like Apollos, for example, the preacher of preachers. He had been building on Paul's foundation, cultivating the Corinthians' capacity for more solid theological food, the eight-ounce sirloins, if you will. But, and you can hear the pain and the rebuke in Paul's words, even now, you are not yet ready. They should have been ready. But they weren't. They should be exploring the depths and the dimensions of God's grace and Christ, renewing their minds in the gospel. But that's not where they were. You see, there were these certain teachers that found their way into Corinth. Uh, we know them as the super apostles. I'm going to Bible say, you know all about the super apostles by now. They came into Corinth and they had been turning the people away. They had been undermining Paul's authority. They were turning people away uh, with their passion for righteousness, passion for being extra spiritual. And they had, as Paul calls them, lofty opinions and arguments. What they ended up doing was teaching a different Jesus. Not one who finished it all for sinners, but one that still demands things for you to do in order to be saved. They, they preached a different gospel. They appealed also to the wisdom of the world, making comparisons and judging success by worldly standards. They did not appeal to the wisdom of the cross that Paul preached. They added the need, again, for personal righteousness. They, they found ways to become more spiritual than others. They taught secret knowledge, things that uh, you, know, you, could, you could build on, tap into if you position yourself in the right way. And with all of this, it resulted in pride. Right? When you have different divisions, when you have different spiritualities, it results in pride, comparison, and divisions. And that, of course, is the first problem that Paul is addressing in his letter. In short, uh, they had been swept away by lies. And they forgot the truth. 
they abandoned the foundation that Paul had built and that Apollos had been building on and others had been building on too. And so Paul says it shouldn't be this way. We've been building you up in the gospel so that you would stand firm against these lies, so you can meet uh, false teaching, that you can meet suffering, that you can meet anything that comes your way being founded on the gospel. But even now, you are not yet ready. Well, what about you? Have you been a Christian longer than the Christians in Corinth were at this point? How long have you been counted among the baptized? More than five years? Ten years? Your entire life? Are you ready for more solid food? Or do you find yourself swept away by the morality and the agendas of an unbelieving world? Is your mind being transformed and renewed by the mind of Christ, solid in hope, abounding in grace and forgiveness? Or are we continuing to live as if nothing has changed? Maybe I'll ask it in a more practical way. Have you given yourself over to a life of studying the scriptures and Bible study? And then the regular reception of the Lord's Supper in the worship life of the church. Have your prayers deepened? Can, can you make a confession of the hope that you have to someone else? At uh, my previous call in, uh, at St. Luke's in Washington State, on the other side of the country, I was in charge uh, of our confirmation program. <laughs> And every year throughout uh, grade school and, and uh, through high school, you, every year had a different theme. It had a, uh, an event of some kind. Ninth grade was our confirmation year. And so we spent that year in, in deep instruction uh, and commitments, time commitments, and always, of course, hoping for a lot of parental participation as well. We had an hour-long class just about every Sunday morning two weekend-long retreats. There was a lot of information, and I wish we had more time, even though it seems like we had a lot of time, because there was just a lot to cover. And what we did was, we started with the basics. We started with the milk, like, starting at, literally, just the beginning, right? This is what Christianity is, right? Christianity 101, kindergarten Christianity, Christ and him crucified for sinners. And then moving on into the, the small catechism, you know, building on that foundation, going into the Ten Commandments. This is what God's law is. This is what, what sin is. This is how you fall short of the Ten Commandments. This is why you need what God has done for you. So then we go into the creed, the Apostles' Creed. This is what God does for you. And then, then you bring your request to God in the Lord's Prayer. Right, we go through that, we go through the sacraments, baptism, confession and absolution, the Lord's Supper, the, the worship life of the church, and so on. There's, there's tests along the way, and there's a final exam, right? Well, one of the things that I did was at the very end of the year, uh, as a final way to connect with each student personally, I required them to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with me. I'm obviously very intimidating, so it's very scary. <laughs> And uh, the purpose, of course, was to check in and, well, okay, at Confirmation Sunday, they're going to get up before the congregation and say, I would rather die than fall away from this faith. So I kind of want to know that they know what faith they're confessing before they get up and say, yeah, you know, I'm going to hold to this my entire life. So we would do that. We would sit and we would have, um, you know, a Kind of like an instruction to see how you're doing, and, and I would ask these questions. Um, my, my first question was usually something like this, and I asked it in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way. Let's say you're standing, you know, like the old joke, let's say you're standing before the gates of heaven. 
St. Peter is there. And he's got his book, and he asks you why he should let you in. What would you say? What I'm looking for, of course, although I asked in a tongue-in-cheek way, is just the basis of their faith. I'm looking for the milk answer, right? I'm looking for the confession of faith that Jesus died for me. Why? Because Jesus died for me. Some variation of that, right? Christ died for my sins. My hope is in Jesus. This one particular year, I sat down with a young man for his final interview, and uh, I asked him the question, why should he let you in? What would you say? And almost after nine months of confirmation classes and retreats, this young man looked at me and he said, well, because I'm a pretty good person, I, of course, wouldn't dare to try to put myself in Paul's shoes, but I, I have to believe that I understood to some degree what he felt when he wrote, and even now, you are not yet ready. That interview, of course, went a lot longer than all the others that year. Because what had to happen was we had to toss everything out. Tear it all down and go back to the beginning. Day one of confirmation. There was a disconnect. We missed it. This question should have been a formality and if the whole class was like a formality to him. Where is your hope? What is the foundation? Christ and him crucified. He had forgotten. He had been swept up in the lie of the world. That, that goodness gets you in and badness keeps you out. So I didn't let him leave that office until I knew. He had heard, at least without a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus died for him and took his sins away. Now, I don't want you to, to misunderstand me either and hear me wrong. When we're referring to milk and eight-ounce sirloin steak, solid food, both of them are the gospel. The gospel is the milk. The gospel is the solid food. We are not moving past the gospel to get to something else, like a, a hyper-spirituality or secret knowledge or moral self-righteousness. Uh, we're, we're always fed the gospel, and we build on our understanding of the gospel, the dimensions and depth of God's grace. We don't move away from Jesus. We don't move away from our need for Jesus. We grow in our dependence of Jesus, our dependence of his grace. And Christ and him crucified that his gospel message renews and transforms our minds. It changes how we think, how we live. It changes our worldview, right? How we live in this world, how we view the world. It affects how we set our priorities, how we make sense of what we see and experience. It affects how we mourn. It affects how we are comforted, how we find hope in hopeless situations, how we find meaning in everything that we do and everything that happens to us, how we deal with the suffering of the world and our own suffering, how we see God at work in the world and in our lives, how we stand firm and encourage one another against lies, against false Jesuses, false teaching. The gospel message of Christ and Him crucified is everything. And we forget. And we're like, like kids who, who go after the shiny new thing. We see something that appeals to our, our sinful nature, our itching ears. And that's the danger. That's what's happening in Corinth. They needed milk because they had forgotten. They hadn't matured. They had been swept away by flashy Shiny teachings and motivations. They had been led astray. Paul needed to call them out on it, tearing it all down 
so that he could build the foundation once again. And of course, Paul knew the Corinthians would get defensive. He knows that they have inner lawyers, as we all do. And as soon as we get called out on things, we get defensive. You don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm working through. And you can hear the retorts. Paul, you can't say that about me. I've been a Christian for so long now. I was one of the first converts of this church. I used to teach Sunday school. I get there when I can. My parents still participate regularly. I'm good. I pray every night. You don't know what's in my heart. It's true. Paul doesn't know what's in their hearts, but he doesn't need to because he knows what's coming out of their mouths. This is why he tells them, listen, I know you guys are still infants needing milk because I know the things that you have been saying. I've seen your social media posts. I see the stuff that you retweet. I see the stuff that you repost. This is not what spiritual maturity, this is not what dependence on Jesus looks like. This is what being swept up in the world looks like. Some say, I belong to Paul, and others say, I belong to Apollos. What is this about? You're really fighting about this, he's saying. You're comparing and dividing, and you've lost sight Christ. This isn't maturity. This is infantile. You should be past this, but even now, you are not yet ready. In another letter, jumping to the, the letter of Ephesians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, Paul writes, and God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? So that we would no longer be children. He says, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and defeat, deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This being tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. This is what's going on in Corinth. And Paul doesn't want it to be so. Pastors don't want it to be so. I don't want it to be so. God doesn't want it to be so. It's for you. For your comfort. Your assurance. As you go out into the world and face all kinds of waves out there. This is why God provides for his church so that we would be built up. This need for maturity is not to make divisions. It's not to make us extra spiritual than other people. It's because we're forgetful sheep. And there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of suffering and death and God knows it and he does not want anyone swept away but to be firmly planted on his promises in Christ unmoved in the face of lies, of sin, and death. But even when the church in Corinth was not yet ready, and even when you are not yet ready, the gospel is still for you. When we are faithless, God is faithful. And he is still good. And Paul is quick to comfort them after this rebuke. You're arguing about Apollos and Paul. He writes, what are they? Not who are they. What are they? They're servants. Don't forget that it's God who's doing all the work. 
God is the one who's doing the growing. We are fellow workers, but you are God's field. God's building. In other words, even though you have forgotten God has not forgotten you. Even though you were swept away by lofty opinions and arguments, God's claim on you has not been swept away. You still belong to him. His baptismal claim on you is still good. Nothing can change that. You are God's building. You are God's field. And let this be a good word for you this morning, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. If it's milk you need, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He will provide milk in abundance. And if you can stomach an eight-ounce steak, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and that he will provide steaks aplenty. He will provide for your growth he will provide for your hope, your joy, your faith. He is rich in delicious gospel food. Just taste and see, dear friends. He knows what you face. He knows what you need. He has good gifts to give you, and you belong to him no matter what. So together, then, let us continue to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the conscious power. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. God of grace and God of glory, we give thanks to you this day. You do not leave us in silence, but continually comfort, defend, and strengthen us by your word and spirit. On your people, pour your power, crown your ancient church's story, build its bud to glorious flower. Bless your holy church throughout the world and guide and direct all nations and kingdoms among men. Will the hosts of evil round us scorn the Christ assail his ways from the fears that long have bound us from our hearts to faith and praise? In the forgiveness of our sins as your own children by our baptism into Christ, give to all in need healing for the sick restoration to the broken, confidence to those without hope, and peace to all in trouble. Cure your children's war and madness, bend our pride to your control, shame our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Righteous wisdom, righteous courage, 
remembering all who have gone before us with the sign of faith, especially the prophets and apostles and martyrs of old, as well as those nearer to us whom we name before you in our hearts. Help us to continue walking in faith to your glory and our salvation. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of your salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, as serving you will be glory. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And dear friends, as we have peace with our God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, let us share that peace now with one another.
For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In Him, being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
we stand. gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And we continue with our closing hymn.
blessings on your week. Amen.